in all seriousness, though, uh, I wrote this book. It's called I Have Ears, and it's not just because I have big ears, because I do, because trying to put this thing on, I was like, wow, Josh's ears are smaller than mine. But uh, so I do have big ears, but the point is, is that we have ears, but do we hear from God? Do we open our ears to hear what he's having to say? Because he's constantly speaking. He wants to reveal who he is and what he's about. Are we listening to what he has to say? And this uh, book is kind of my journey through how God has changed me personally, communally, and vocationally. And I want to challenge you that if, if you're struggling with what it means to hear from God, there's some great tools in there. If you're talking about what does it mean to be as a group together and walk through the scriptures together in a powerful way that's very simple, that just uses the Bible, wow, how about that? Use the Bible. That's a great, that will take you from shallow to a lot of places immediately. So I want to encourage you to try ch- Ah, check that out, but also vocationally. If you want to talk about what does it mean to hear from God in your workplace and that he transforms the way that you work, uh, not just that you go to work, but that you are a work and you do get to do his work, then I want to, I want to challenge you to pick up that book for yourself, and I think you'll enjoy it. And if you don't, do not tell me and do not review it. So uh, online, sound good? Yeah, all right, that sounds great. On a serious note, I am glad to be here. Uh, I feel like uh, I've been here a couple times now, so it's kind of feeling like family. I get to come every once in a while, so I was excited to be here. And Josh asked me to come and share uh, because of my heart for this topic and how it relates to community and how you guys have been going through a me uh, to we uh, type series. And we live in a very me-centered society, do we not? I mean, when you think about sports even, sports is a great example, right? There's that ball hog or there's ball movement where you pass the ball, right? Even when they announce basketball teams on TV, what do they say? Steph Curry and the Warriors. Like it's his backup band or something. It's like you can't do it with the rest of them. They're all Tom Brady and the Patriots. We could just get rid of Tom. That would be the greatest thing ever. I'm so glad they lost. Anyway, so if you're a Patriots fan, I have no sympathy for you. You deserved it. So... Here's the, here's the fact. I'm a sports fan, and I do not like the Patriots. But uh, there's a me versus we in politics, is there not? <laughs> there's bipartisan, polarizing politics, and then there's bipartisan, polarizing <laughs> politics, right? There never seems to anybody who's like, hey, let's collaborate and cooperate, and let's do this together. It's just how can we swing the pendulum back and forth that he's the enemy, he's the enemy, he's the enemy. It's always my agenda. It's about me, right? There's me versus we. At the, at the Starbucks, isn't there? My job kind of takes me in jail, but when I'm not in jail, sometimes I can just prop open my computer and work from anywhere. So I get a lot of work done at Starbucks or a coffee place so I don't have to be in the office be interrupted. But there's always the moment when you're just kind of like enjoying your chill time and the guy next to you decides to take the FaceTime call. Not just the phone call, but the FaceTime call. Yeah, I'm in a coffee house. That's literally what happened this week. He goes, yeah. And they just continue to have a conversation, and we're this close to each other. I'm like, it's your world. I'm glad to be in it. It's all about you versus, hey, how about respect the fact there's about 15 other people in here who don't care. <laughs> all right? We want to love you, but we, I'm not right now. All right? I'm having to pray much for you. There's also the me versus we at church, right? They're changing my church. They're moving things around. They're doing things different versus, man, maybe the leadership is trying to move me deeper into my walk and my relationship with Christ. We have a lot of me versus we, don't we? And you guys have been going through that, and you've seen how the me moves us. There's nothing wrong with being me at first, but then there's the we. We have to move to that place where we're brought into community. So much of the scripture, when you see the word you in the New Testament, is actually the southern version, y'all. All right, it's you, everybody. All those verses we love to claim in the Old Testament. This is my personal life verse. Well, it's written to the nation of Israel, so I'm glad it's just for you. But you can have it as your bumper sticker, or we could have it as our community life. And the idea of moving from me to we, and you've seen that, and what does it mean to be in a small group? You're talking about communities. You're talking about you can't do the love one another's and the comfort one another and serve one another unless you have another to serve, right? If not, it's just all about you you can't be reach if it's all about you then you don't reach out into the community and I know I've heard you guys multiple times saying that you want to reach out in the community and as a person who receives the money at focus ministries because I'm part of the fundraising I want to say thank you to the Grove for the offering you gave at Christmas because that was a huge thing and I'll just clap for you but that was a huge thing for us because you're reaching out and there's 
other uh, brochures out there about how to get involved as a volunteer, to do some time <laughs> with us on the inside. So bad jokes, right? But today I want to talk about how do we move from me to we in listening to God? How does, how, does it, how does God speak to us and then that shape community? Because I think there's a huge benefit in that. So if you would, I want to encourage you to turn to the book, turn to the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to start in chapter 3. Um, reading, that's what we're going to start reading. But I want to kind of back up and give you some context. Because context is important in this story. Um, Samuel came about because he had some parents. Ha, ha, ha. Surprise. But uh, Hannah was his mom and Elkanah was his dad. Now back in this day, this was kind of a weird uh, tradition, but you could have more than one wife. Guys, I don't know why, but this is what they did. Girls, I don't know why, but that's what they did. All right, that's just how it was. I have too many lists already and too many things that I need to get done. I don't need a second one helping me out. So that's my thought on double marriage, but that's what's going on here. And so Alcana has two wives. One's name is Hannah and one's name is Penina, and he really likes Hannah a lot better. But Hannah can't have kids and Penina can so women, could you see the tension that all of a sudden comes in there? He thinks, I'm cute, I can give him kids, all right? So there's a little bit of tension, and they go, they're going to what's the Passover feast. They're going to celebrate it at Shiloh, which is basically Jerusalem in the day. And so they're going to celebrate the Passover, the rescue of the Israelites out of Egypt. And as they're celebrating, Hannah's sad. She doesn't have kids. She looks around, Penina's got a bunch of kids. And Elkanah sees her sad and realizes she's sad because she doesn't have kids in the middle of this wonderful Passover festival feast. And he does what every guy should not do. He opened his mouth. <laughs> he decides to say, aren't I better than, than any kids you could have? <laughs> guys, you may not see a problem with that because you think you're, you're good, right? Um, she should love this, right? <laughs> but there's a problem there. And she's not real happy, and she runs to church to pray. <laughs> she's got to get out of the house, so she goes to church to pray. Well, while she's there, Eli, who was the priest at the time, is, is watching this whole scene, and she's down there desperately in front of the Lord praying. She wants a kid. Her heart's broken. She's sad. It's been years. And this is a society when if you can't have a kid, it's a huge, huge mark on who you are even more than it is today. Like, there's some sadness today, but it was a society thing back then that if you couldn't have a kid, then God had shut your womb for a reason. So she has come to the Lord, and she's praying. She's desperate. She's before the Lord praying. And Eli sees her, and Eli is kind of a priest who's kind of waiting to retire. Let's just say that. He's not really pressing forward in the Lord. He's not really leading well. And he sees her desperate praying and thinks she's drunk because he hasn't seen somebody pray desperately in a long time. So he goes to her and says, what are you doing drinking all this wine and you're drunk at church? Which, that would be a good question to ask. And then she looks at him and says, I ain't drunk. I'm praying. <laughs> what are you, lost? And so she says, look, I really want a kid. This is Sean's translation, by the way. This is not even, it's not in your Bible. Like, doesn't say it just like that. Um, but she says, I want a kid. And uh, Eli tells her, listen, you will have a son. And she says, if I can have a son, I'll give him back to the Lord. Well, what we just sang about how God is resurrecting us and giving us new life. I've been reading this book this week uh, by Eugene Peterson. Uh, it's called As the Kingfishers Catch Fire. It's from a poem. Don't ask me. I'm still reading the book. But the idea is that in the middle of this book, he says that God doesn't solve problems he makes people. <laughs> and in a certain sense, he doesn't solve problems. He recreates people. And this story of Hannah having a baby is not new. Because in Abraham's story and Sarah, they couldn't have a child. And then later we see in Elizabeth's story and she couldn't have a child. And Mary, who wasn't even supposed to be having a child, had a child. God is creating people, but then on top of that, he's recreating people who have walked away from him in shame and sin and rebellion, isn't he? He's restoring us from the inside out. He's creating life. He's resurrecting us. And he's resurrected Hannah's womb, and he's given her a child. And she says, I'm going to give him back. So it says, when he was weaned, which people, you know, go back and forth what that means. Um, I've seen animals weaned. I don't know when we say humans weaned. But they say anywhere from 6 to 12 that Samuel was taken to the temple. Well, it had been the tabernacle at the time. And it gives him to Eli. Can you imagine that scene? 
Samuel, his mom, Elkanah, she's walking in and says, hey, remember me? He's like, I don't know. Yeah, kind of. We do the pastor thing. Oh, you're so-and-so. And then she says, no, I'm the lady who was praying, and I had a kid. This is my kid. And I said, if I had a kid, I'd give him to you. This is Samuel, so he's going to live with you and work with you. Can you imagine doing that here? You're going up to Josh. Hey, Josh, I got a kid for you. <laughs> Some of you are like, I'm just going to leave him in the nursery. I'm not even going to check him out. He's yours. Take him. All right, but this is what happens. They give him the child, and he's going to raise the child, and he's going to work in the temple. That's kind of a wild beginning to the story. Now, it's important to know that Eli had two sons, Phineas, not Ferb, but Hophni. So that's a good show. But Phineas and Hophni were not good people, all right? They were priests in the house, but they stole from the Lord. They did a lot worse things we won't talk about, but they were just bad dudes, and Eli's not being a father, he's not being a leader, he's not shutting them down, he's allowing them to steal from the offering, to take from whatever they want, and to just be just promiscuous and horrible. And this is the setting in which chapter 3 starts, okay? So open your Bibles if you would, let's start reading there. So it says, Now the young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There were no frequent visions. Let's just pause there for a second. It says, the word of the Lord was rare. The reason it's rare is because there's a lot of disobedience and there's a lot of distractions. God has decided to shut up his speaking and not reveal through the, through the priesthood because they're not following the Lord. I mean, imagine that. The people who are supposed to be your shepherds and your spiritual guides, the leaders of the flock, they're not even hearing from God, so they can't deliver a message. And it just seems like there's days and days and weeks and weeks that have gone by where God is not speaking. People aren't receiving visions from him. They're not being encouraged from his word. They're not getting a message from a prophet. There's nothing being told to them. Can you imagine going weeks and weeks and weeks and not knowing what it's like to hear God's voice? Some of you say, I'm doing that now. The word of the Lord was rare. And also because, not just the disobedience, but because of distraction. You ever find yourself distracted from God's voice? You, if you don't believe in spiritual warfare and distractions in your life, try to sit down in a quiet place for 15 minutes and pray and not be distracted by your phone, your to-do list, or your kids. Right? The time when you decide to do that is when you remember all the things you had to do at your house. Lord, I'm here to pray. Oh, wait a minute. The laundry. Oh, that's that one thing I need to get at the store. We find ourselves pretty distracted, don't we? But on top of that, we choose distractions. We know everything that's on Netflix or on social media more than we know God's voice. His voice isn't as familiar as Netflix. We have some Netflix crazed people right now. And I'm looking out, some of you are looking at each other. <laughs> That's okay. My house gets the same chastisement. We have a question to be asking ourselves. Social media. I mean, we can't go so long. Did you see this, what happened, so and so, da 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 And we're so distracted. We know more what happened to somebody across the globe or across the street or somewhere else. And we know all the gossip about their life or all the updates about anybody. But we haven't heard from the voice of the Lord in a long time, have we? The word of the Lord was rare, and the question is, if it's rare, do people even notice? If God's speaking and you're not listening, do you even notice? The story goes on, and it says, At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. This means he's gotten old, all right? You could tell your parents that if you want to. Your eyesight's getting dim, all right? <laughs> or you could just say they're getting old. But he's also lying down his place. So he's got his room there at the tabernacle where he's staying. It says, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple where the ark of God was. Now, the lamp of God would basically just be an oil lamp. They put enough oil in there to last all night long so that at daylight it would go out. So it's basically night light. So the night light's about to go out. So this is basically giving us the time frame that it's right before sunrise that this scene is about to happen. And he's lying down in the temple near the ark of God. 
ark of God was the place where they put the Ten Commandments, the bread of manna. They put it on poles and they carried it. When they came to the promised land, go read the, in the Exodus story. They come to the promised land and it's, it's a representation of God's presence with the people of Israel. So they roll up on the Jordan River and the water stops and they come through on dry land and they enter into this land of promise that God has delivered to them. The ark was the presence of God with them. So Samuel is with the priest. He's staying in the temple. He's near this wonderful relic and symbolic presence of God. And this is where the whole scene's taking place. It says, Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here am I. And he ran to Eli. And he said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I didn't call you. Go lie down. So he went and lay down. Then the Lord called Samuel again. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called for me. But he said, I didn't call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the word of the Lord, or excuse me, did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. Then Samuel called, then the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood again, calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. Pretty cool. Can't imagine that kind of moment. I mean, my kids come in my room in the middle of the night. I'm like, go back to bed. What are you doing? Get out of here. That's exactly what's going on. The Lord's calling Samuel. Samuel doesn't realize it's the Lord. Verse 7 says what? It says that he did not yet know the Lord and had not had the word of the Lord revealed to him yet. How is that possible? This kid's been serving with Eli. He's living in the temple. He's sleeping next to the Ark of the Covenant. How has he not caught this yet? And the truth of the matter is you don't inherit the gospel it doesn't happen through osmosis. You don't just get it by growing up in church. Everybody around here, when I talk to people after a while, they say, oh, my granddaddy was a pastor and my aunt took me to church all the time. I'm like, well, that's wonderful, but do you have a relationship with the Lord? Well, no, but my granddaddy was a pastor. Well, that's wonderful. You don't inherit the gospel. and You don't inherit the good news of the kingdom. You get to receive this gift when the Lord reveals himself to you. Samuel was at this place where God was revealing him, and Samuel had to make a personal decision. I will trust in the voice of the Lord, and I will respond and follow him in an obedience. Is that where you're at? Have you been to that place? Do you remember when that happened in your life? I remember at the age of seven, for me, I started asking a lot of questions and said to my parents some questions, and they're like, this is great. And they brought our pastor in, and I prayed right there on my Star Wars sheets in my bed and asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I began to hear God's voice over and over and over. At age 13, I began to hear, he needs to be the Lord of your life. At age 18, he started to talk about my career, and I just said, no, I have a better idea. I'll do what I want. I want to be a lawyer. Age 19 and 20, I became a pastor and gave up the lawyer thing. Ah, isn't that interesting how God does that wonderful thing for you? And then he said, I want you to follow me into the ministry. So I did that, went and served in the ministry. God continues to speak. But that relationship is my response to the Lord. I didn't inherit any of those things. You can't inherit God. You're not just going to get it by being close. You have to respond to the voice of the Lord yourself. And Samuel does, because what does he say? Lord, speak, <laughs> for your servant hears. That's a great response when God says something, right? When God asked me to go into the ministry, I said, no, <laughs> no. My dad was a pastor, and I saw the heartache that he went through and the hard times and the good times, and I saw the, I saw the bank account, and I was like, there's no way. I'm not doing that. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'll, I'll teach Sunday school for some kids or something. How about that? We'll make a deal. He won. But then 16 years into it, he said, I want you to resign from your church, and I don't want you to get paid to be a pastor. I said, you're, you're good. <laughs> you're good at this, like, trickery stuff because this is all I was trained to do, and this is all I've done for 16 years for full time, and I have a good gig going. Please do not challenge me here, all right? 
because I'm not doing it. And for a year, I have a, a thing with years, I think, uh, I said no, and then God finally said, <laughs> go. And I did, and that's how I ended up here. And we left, and you'll read about that in the book when you buy it, self promo. There it is. So <laughs> the idea of God is speaking to you, are you listening? And when he says, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, is that how you respond to God? Now look what the Lord says to Samuel. It says, then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. People have ears. It says, behold, I'm about to do a thing. Now, in writing or in English, when you write something, you're supposed to not use the word thing. You're supposed to say, I'm about to do an event. I'm about to do a miracle. But God himself breaks all the rules, so you can tell your English teacher that. It says, God says, I'm about to do a thing. Like you can put a little soul in. I'm about to do a thing and everybody's ear is going to tingle. If God woke you up tomorrow and said, I'm about to do something crazy and everybody's going to be like, look out. Now you're buckled up for this is going to be great news, right? Great news. Here's the great news Samuel gets. On the day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. What did he speak? He says, and I will declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because he was not shepherding his sons. Parents, here's a thought. God is about to judge his family because he wasn't going to be a shepherd to his kids. Nobody asked you to be your, your child's friend. They asked you to be a parent. <laughs> That's a little side parenting note. That's a whole free conference you just got right there. All right? Anyway, then he says... I'm about, to do th I'm about to punish this house forever for the iniquity that he knew of because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by the sacrifice of offering forever. In other words, he's saying, I'm done. There will be punishment. And Samuel lay there until morning. Then, the open, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. You think? This wonderful miracle thing that God's going to tell him that everybody's ears are going to tingle is bad news for Eli. This is his mentor. This is the guy he works for. And he's got to tell him, oh, by the way, God's going to judge you. And the judgment that is going to be is that Eli's going to die when he hears that his two sons have died. He's going to fall over backwards and die. That's, that's what happens in the next chapter. That's hard news. But this is what Samuel's been given advance notice on, good news from the Lord, this is the vision in the middle of the night. <laughs> Word of the Lord is rare, and what he shows up with is some rough news, isn't it? There's a new sheriff in town, and it's not going to be Eli. And this is what he says. But Eli called Samuel and said to him, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And he, Eli said to him, what is it that was told to you? Do not hide it from me. May God so do to you more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. Anybody have parents who are really good at guilt? Eli's pretty good at guilt, right? This would be my mom. If you don't tell me, God's going to punish you even worse, <laughs> right? Like, that was just, it's just kind of funny how he does that. I mean, he just kind of throws it out there. Tell me what God said to you, and if it doesn't, it's going to happen to you. So Samuel did what? Told him everything and hid nothing. That had to be a hard moment, huh? And then Eli says this. It is the Lord let him do what, se what, he seems, what seems good to him. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Wow. See, you'll either receive the, the instruction of the Lord or the discipline of the Lord. You'll either submit or be submitted on a certain level. God is asking for you to obey, and then he will force it. Every knee will bow is a joy if you love the Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and those under the earth. Even those who have rejected will bow. Obedience is an invitation, and it's a lot better when it comes from you <laughs> versus when God forces it, isn't it? But Eli realizes where he's at, and he says, let it be as God has spoken. Then the story goes on to say this. 
And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let nothing of his words fall to the ground. And, the, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. There's a powerful thought right here. It says, the word of the Lord was rare. Nobody was speaking. And then Eli's about to be deposed as the priest and the leader of Israel. And Samuel's about to be raised up, and God has become his teacher. And so God begins to pour out these words to him and messages and truth. And it says that Samuel was receiving them and nothing fell to the ground. Nothing was wasted. Nothing was forbidden or left out. Of all the things that God has spoken to you, has there ever been a moment where something fell to the ground or got wasted or ignored? If you had to put it on a percentage meter, right? There are probably seasons where like, woo, don't look at that percentage, right? They have that one day where like, I hit 98, woo, heard everything from the Lord, obeyed it, did it. I think back through my life and think of all the times that God has spoken and how much I've let some of those precious words fall to the ground. But it says Samuel let nothing fall to the ground, and he allowed everything that the Lord is speaking to him to challenge and grow and stretch him and make him the leader God wanted him to be. See, that's the me that he needed. Samuel needed to be spoke to and encouraged by the Lord, but it doesn't stop there. It does move to the we, because look what it says next. In all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, you guys know where those places are, you know, Dan, Beersheba? No. You have to find the map in the back of your Bible and try to figure it out, right? Basically, it's saying the whole region. So that'd be like saying for all of East Tennessee or all Tennessee, everybody knew. Everybody knew what? That Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Why? Because not only was he being poured into, was he a sponge that was soaking up all the greatness of God, but he was being squeezed out and he was sharing that good news with other people. That's where the we comes in because I don't just receive from the Lord all week, but I take what I receive and I give it to somebody else. We do that in community. We do that as a blessing to somebody else, as an encouragement. We do that to the lost because they're looking for a hope that is only found in Jesus Christ. And if we don't squeeze that sponge out for them, then what are they going to get? From Dan to Beersheba, everybody knew that Samuel was God's man. From Powell to Halls to wherever you go, where I'm at in Seymour to Knoxville, does God use you? Do people know that you're a prophet for him? And you say, well, I don't know. I don't want to be a prophet. Listen, a prophet just declared the word of the Lord. So join the club. You're now a prophet. A priest connected people to God. You get to connect people to God. You're a prophet and a priest in your town and in your home. Will people know it? It's not just that, you know, people make that assumption, oh, this is my personal relationship with God. What I do with God is between me, and it's, it's just private between us. <laughs> That's not the Bible. The Bible says that it becomes yours and that you give it out to others. And, in fact, half of the chastisement in the Old Testament prophets is because Israel said, this is for us and for us alone. And he said, no, I'm using you to be a blessing to the nations. Go back and read Genesis 12. God is moving you from what I hear personally, to how do I now share communally. From Dan to Beersheba, everybody knew. And the Lord appeared at Shiloh again, and the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And if you read throughout the rest of 1 Samuel, you'll see how Samuel is used as a mouthpiece for God and how he holds the nation accountable for the times that they decide to walk away the times that he moves into Paul's life and says, this is the word of the Lord that was spoken to you, and you rejected it. And so God has rejected you as king of Israel. And you'll see the other times when he says, this is the way the Lord walked in it, and the nation did it. But the beauty is, is will we be a Samuel? Will we be someone who takes the word of the Lord and shares it? That means you have to have the word of the Lord first, right? That might mean you have to dust off the word of the Lord, right? Go find your Bible. And I'm picky because...
because I'm still old school and I, my eyes are dim, I guess. I'm getting old. But I'm not a big fan of the digital. Like, it's okay to have a digital Bible, but there's something beautiful about opening a sacred book and being able to touch the pages and know where things are and know that the Bible's really not alphabetized. Like your app is. Oh, Acts is not at the beginning. Wait a minute, I'm lost. There's something beautiful about being in the Word and allowing God to speak to you. There's something amazing about cherishing some time, whether it's in the morning or the afternoon or the evening. Whenever you cherish time to do this and give your attention, you can carve out that moment to let God speak to you. That you read His Word and say, God, now speak. That in prayer, that you don't just turn it into wish list land or intercession for everybody else, but you stop and you pause and you wait and you say, Lord, speak to me. And I've been always reminded that in prayer, the person who's the most important should do the most talking. Does that define your prayer life? Lord, here's my thought and my need and my concern. And now I just wait and I listen for what you have to say. And I trust that the impressions that you put on my heart and the thoughts that you bring to my mind and the verses that you rise to the surface after I've read from you and I know your character, that I'm going to take those things to heart. Is there a time in your day when you're devoting to allowing God to fill you? that you're trusting the scriptures and his voice to fill you. And the fun part is the more you do this in the middle of the scriptures, the more when you're not in the middle of scriptures, God jumps you and begins to talk to you. And so while you're taking out the trash because your son didn't take out the trash yet again, and you're grumbling the hundred steps it is to the garage to put the trash up. This is a personal story if you haven't figured this out yet. And you're grumbling about why do I always have to take out the trash? Why does he not do what I tell him to do? And the Lord's saying, boy, that sounds familiar, Sean, doesn't it? Remember when I asked you to walk in these steps and you just haven't done it? (laughs) I said, no, I just want to be in my own anger world. You leave me alone right now. Isn't it amazing how because you know the voice of the Lord through his word and you spend time in prayer that he jumps you in the middle of other moments? (laughs) Or even in those moments when it's just too painful to open the word or you don't even know what to pray and yet God's comfort just swells in and comes in and you know it's him because you felt that before in his word. Is there a time when you're allowing that to happen? And the beauty is, if you do, now you have something to share. There's a lot we probably share with people all week. Hey, did you hear? Dot, dot, dot. How much of after that dot, dot, dot is something from the Lord that you've heard from him? That's a thought to think about. Moving from me to we says, I'm going to soak up and then I'm going to squeeze that sponge and you're going to know. My mentor uses that phrase a lot. <laughs> How have you, he, he'll say, squeeze the sponge. Squeeze the sponge, tell me what's going on. And if I know if I haven't been in the Word, if I've not been meditating on the Lord, there's not really much to squeeze. And that leads to a great conversation. How much do you need to squeeze? How much do you need to soak up? Where are you at today? I'm going to invite you to do this. Would you just, let's take a moment and just pray. I'm just going to create some space of quiet. I'm not going to turn a lot of time into this but I do want to invite you to think about this maybe you need to receive from the Lord today the word of the Lord has been revealed you don't have a relationship and just like Samuel you need to receive that relationship maybe you've been challenged in other places maybe you need to be challenged to share what you're hearing maybe to recommit to your time in the word Whatever the Lord is leading you into, I'm going to ask that you just spend some time in prayer. What has he spoken to you this morning? I've read this passage a thousand times, and every time it speaks something new and fresh. And I'm going to give you a couple moments in space. What is the Lord doing in you? Let's just bow our heads in prayer.
I want to leave you with one last word of scripture that moves us from the me to we as it comes to listening to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16 and 17 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I cannot tell you how much that section of that verse means to me, that God's word is something I savor and I love that it inhabits my heart and my mind. That when I'm in the midst of it, it's just so rich. But that verse doesn't stop there because it does move to the we. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And teaching and admonishing means that you exalt and you lift up and sometimes you exhort and discipline. And it says, with singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, even the songs we sing should be reflected out of our time in the Word and should remind us of places in the Word. As I'm singing that He is resurrecting me, I'm thinking about how God has resurrected Hannah's womb and He's brought new life to her and how He's bringing new life to me. Even the songs we sing become a way for that we as a body share what's happening in our hearts. And it says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do it everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God our Father through him. Amen. Let's sing together.